There's no drinks on coffee and spread when you can see. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to those of you that are here, as well as welcome to our online students and our online faculty who are joining us through our live stream. My name is Carl Dothman, and I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design. Skilled designers have at least two very important traits, empathy and curiosity. On the topic of curiosity, some designers learn how to do things, and ideally designers keep learning new skills throughout their life, but there's also another set of designers, those that do things to learn. My guess is that Cezanne Charles does both. She's right here. <laughs> uh, she seems to be constantly learning how to do new things, while also constantly looking for new projects that allow her to learn. Cezanne has two lives. I was going to say she's a lot like a superhero, but superheroes have a day job where they can lay low and they can be mild-mannered. Instead, Cezanne is passionate and incredibly successful in both of her lives, and this is really unique. These two roles allow her to operate differently in different contexts, uh, and both roles allow her to exercise both her curiosity and her empathy to incredible degrees. Cezanne earned her undergraduate degree in theater studies from Ohio State. And more recently, she received a Master's of Public Administration from the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. So you can get a sense I'm not making up these kind of dual lives. Two different competing schools, radically different degrees. Uh, and I also just realized, I think Cezanne and I have known each other for just about 10 years now. Um, and I know Cezanne as a designer researcher. I've had the opportunity to collaborate with her and her design firm on a number of occasions. In 1989, Cezanne co-founded with John Marshall their design practice called Root of Two. Root of Two, one word, all lowercase, no spaces. 1.414213562373095048 is also the way that you can understand that. Root of Two loves their numbers. Root of Two is also a research and practice-driven hybrid design studio. Cezanne and John work to create a condition where they can perceive themselves, the here and now, and the future differently. Root of Two makes social objects, experiences, and works for the public realm. Typically, they work at the scale of devices, furniture, or small buildings. While working on design, technology, social justice, and public policy for future making. Their projects are designed to disrupt and reframe systems, networks, and infrastructures. Their work has been exhibited in Australia, Brazil, China, Denmark, Japan, Macedonia, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, the UK, and the US. I think we should probably invite Cezanne and John back to LTU to talk about Route of Two, because today, Cezanne's not going to talk about any of those things. <laughs> this is the dual life part of it. So here's the other introduction. Cezanne Charles is the Director of Creative Industries for Creative Many Michigan. She co-leads the design and implementation of Creative Many's Creative Industries research efforts. Creative Many was formerly ArtServe Michigan, and it was headquartered in Wixom. And with Cezanne's effort, uh, there was a location change there was a rebranding and a renaming. Creative Many is now in Detroit. Their mission is to develop creative people, creative places, and the creative, and the creative economy for a competitive Michigan. They do this through research, research, advocacy, professional practice, funding, and communications. Some of you might be familiar with this. It's an important yearly report and publication that collects their research on the creative industries of Michigan. And this is what she's going to be talking about tonight. Cezanne directs Creative Many's programs, providing the knowledge, funding, networks, and advocacy needed to empower the practices of artists and designers. Programs under her direction include the Kresge Art Fellows, Professional Practice Opportunities Program, Resident Detroit, 
which has to deal with placemaking in Detroit at the intersection of social justice and impact. Created many programs and seminars for artists and lawyers for the Creative Economy Initiative. Cezanne Cezanne serves on the Detroit Creative Corridor Center Advisory Board and the Board of Directors of Allied Media Projects. She's currently curating the Shift Space exhibition as part of the 2017 Saint Etienne International Design Biennale, which Aaron Jones will also be exhibiting his work. And she's getting on a flight tomorrow morning to Miami to be installing or looking at installing work in Miami soon. Yes. What's the chicken project called? Wither Veins. Check out, check out Wither Veins. Yes. It's a really crazy project. <laughs> um, so I was in a recent meeting at the university where someone referenced the, the lecture series as the ARCA lecture series. And this caught me off guard. I think it's also an old term. Over the past few years, the architecture-centric focus of the college lecture series has begun to open up. The College of Architecture and Design is a college of design, and as such, uh, what may have been architecture-focused fo set of discussions has become more broad and more inclusive. Cezanne is a designer able to operate in broad circles and able to speak many different languages. She's an incredible model of broad disciplinary thinking and is here to share her insights on the creative industries of Michigan. This topic impacts all of us in the college. Please join me in welcoming Cezanne Charles. Thank you so much, and thank you to LTU for hosting me today, uh, and thank you to Carl for inviting me. Um, I also was reflecting on my nearly nine years in Michigan and kind of thinking about all the things that I've learned and all the things that I've wanted to take in um, through that time. And I found myself really kind of questioning how we think about the economic frame, right? At the center of our discourse, at the center of our civic lives, and the way that we make decision-making writ large Everything from the built environment to the way that we think about building sustainable businesses as individual artists and creative practitioners. And so this talk really is going to get into that. And I call it rereading the creative economy because most of us understood the creative economy maybe first and foremost by something that Richard Florida wrote, right? So we have this idea basically that somehow the creative class can occupy a space, can transform neighborhoods and districts for the betterment of all, perhaps, right? And then as a consequence of that, the real economy can take over, right? That's generally the idea of the creative economy as it was experienced and as it was kind of codified in the US. But there's actually an older definition and an older understanding of the creative industries, and that's where I first encountered this. And so in porting this over to my work in Michigan, I had to think very carefully about how society that has been deindustrialized is actually thinking about the creative economy, but from a place of equity and from a place of inclusion. And so this talk kind of gets into that a little bit, but it also talks about our research. So as Carl mentioned, our mission is to develop creative people, creative places, and the creative economy for a competitive Michigan. And so I'm gonna key in on this part about the competitive Michigan, right? Because we actually think that creative people have a responsibility and a role to play in actually driving Michigan's future and driving it forward. But that's a tall order. We're one agency, it's a six person staff, it's a tiny team who all do kind of really amazing work. Um, so I can't take credit for everything. Um, but we really are trying to figure out how this happens in a peer and an evidence-based approach, right? So that cross-cuts all of our work. So whether that's advocacy and policy making, or whether that's programs and services, the area that I spend most of my time in, as well as funding and investment, which is a new area of our work that I'm growing into, as well as our strategic communications. So how we think about that, first and foremost, has to do with all of you. Right? We don't do this in a vacuum. We don't do this closeted away. It's very much about the lived experience of individual practitioners, small and mid-sized nonprofits, our large nonprofit arts and cultural anchor organizations, as well as our corporate entities, whether that be a steel case or a Herman Miller or a Guardian Glass. Right? We want to be in those conversations because creativity connects to all of them. And so some of our initiatives we put in these three buckets. We aim to empower we aim to frame and we aim to invest in the creative economy, right? And so for me, 
these are a couple of the barriers that Carl has already covered, but I'm going to talk about specifically a couple of things around this frame. Because right now, more than ever, all of us as individual artists and creative practitioners, or as teachers and educators, or as people who are working in the creative industries as startups, we have to be thinking about how we're constantly making the case for our work in this day and age. And some of that is going to be evidence-based. But I'm also going to say today that there's a lot of doubt about the future of evidence-based work, right? So having said that, we have to do other things, right? So one of the initiatives, one of the ways that we storytell and make the case, the way that we frame, is through things like Michigan House, where we set up a house at South by Southwest, where we strip everything out of it that was there, and we fill it with all of the goodness of Michigan design, innovation, art, and technology over the course of South by Southwest. And then we host panel conversations and talks and screenings. So that's another way that we're empowering and thinking about framing the creative industries in Michigan. And we're going to do the same again during Saint Etienne, um, which is another kind of experimental space for actually positing out how designers are thinking about the future, not just of their own work and livelihoods and practice, but at larger systemic impacts to the economy, whether that be automation and digitization, or really this future piece around equity and inclusion. We're going to surface that and have really meaningful dialogue, all in a Detroit-style cafe. So that's how we think about framing. It is very much the research study, but it is also these other events and opportunities. And so first and foremost, I have an agnostic approach to the economy, right? So this all started with the idea that most of us, when we think about the economy, we might know a little something about capitalism, but we probably learned it vaguely in history as an Adam Smith kind of conceit, and then we kind of quickly moved on to something that felt a little bit more like a neoclassical idea. We might have heard about this guy called Marx, maybe, right? But what I've learned is that there's no fewer than nine schools of economic thought. So capitalism isn't a monolith, and it isn't one thing, right? Nor is Marxism, nor is a kind of socialist economic frame. And so when we think about this, we have these two titans that we constantly ideologically reference when we think about the economy. But this is actually the economy that we're really sitting in, right? We are actually competing with the kind of Austri Austrian school, which is kind of what we think of as like neoliberalism, kind of globalization, however you feel about that. That's where that body of knowledge comes. Then when we sort of think about the immediate post-war period, we were doing a lot of heavy lifting on this kind of Keynesian economic model, where we were actually using government to like grow and incentivize and bring back civilization and society. I would posit that these things have been operating on an either or, rather than a both and. And so we get into kind of things like Schumpeterian, which is all about kind of innovation. So when you hear people making reference to the innovation economy and knowledge economy, what they're actually talking about is a kind of light way of referencing, like Schumpeterian's work. When you hear about Freakonomics, right, it's all of a sudden, wait a minute, humans don't make decisions out of boundedly rational ways? Right, that's, that's what we're calling behavioralist, right? And so all of these things have their very serious basis, but they also have really accessible books around economic knowledge that anybody can dive into. And I, as a practitioner, did not have the training for this, but I dove into it, and there's a couple reasons why. First, Michigan about eight years ago, when I first started at ArtServe Michigan, was about to zero out all of its arts funding in the state. And I'm having a little bit of deja vu if you've been following what's going on with the NEA and the NEH and PBS, right? Because we faced this fight before. And at the time we thought, you know, if only we pivot to the economic frame, if only we can speak the lingua franca of government, then we too can enjoy the spoils of investment from government. And so we began a body of work that started with our cultural data project that only looked at nonprofit arts and culture, then moved into how we document and quantify individual artists, labor in the marketplace, and then we kind of moved into this body of how do we tell the really big story? How do we tell the comprehensive story about the creative industries in Michigan? And so that led to our creative state work. And that's what I'm really gonna dive in today. We started this body of work in 2014 with a pilot study. We then got funding from the US Economic Development Administration. We're one of the few arts organizations that have actually been able to compete at a national level in order to get EDA support. It's also one of the 17 agencies up for cut, right? 
So our work is going to be impacted in ways we just don't know from so many agencies and so many industries. But having said that, this body of work was released in 2016. And so for us, the creative industries is about telling the story about how do we create vibrant, meaningful places. We do that through disciplinary work all the time. Right? We know as architects and designers our contribution to the built and lived experience of our cities. We know when we get it right, we enjoy those places more. And we know when we get it wrong, we perpetuate systems of inequities. So we have a stake in making sure it's right. And in order to make sure it's right, we need investment. And so really for us, it's about this idea of how do we create opportunities to grow vibrancy, grow sustainability, and grow resilience for the maker, for the creator, for the producer. And so the way that we think about this study is it's an update and an expansion of kind of work that's been taking place on the down low a little bit in the US, right? We've been doing kind of creative industry studies since about 1997. I think New England Foundation for the Arts was the first one to come up with a big study. And so we had to develop and tweak it for our own particular state. And so these are just some of our funding partners because we always have to thank our funders. So again, you know, this is an amazing group to consider, right? We have both foundations that are actually investing in individual artists. We also have major corporations through their foundations that invest heavily in the building sector. We also have an agency that now is the leading designee for the UNESCO City of Design designation for the city of Detroit. We have economic development. We have a global foundation through Ford that's really looking at equity and inclusion. And finally, we have a big government agency that's backing this work. All of these people are all of the people that should be having a stake in the future of what designers, makers, artists are doing in Michigan. And so they've come together to support this work. We also have to thank our research partners, because while I would love to take case for everything, I can't, right? So we work very closely with Data Driven Detroit in terms of actually making sure our data is clean and robust and rigorous. We also worked with Care Smith Design, who kind of came on and took over all of the kind of making the both quantitative and qualitative parts of the research work together based on the methodology that was originally designed and developed by Creative Money. So with that, what is the creative economy? So we're going to go old school. We're not going to talk about cafes and bars and how that creates nighttime economy and then makes a neighborhood great. We're going to talk about the way that economists see it. So basically, it's this. You're a creative worker. You work in a creative workplace, right? So the designer who works at Steelcase is one part of the creative economy. The administrative person or the bookkeeper that works at Steelcase is another part of the creative economy. Finally, that designer who's working as part of a medical group or is working in some other industry that's not a creative industry is the final part of the creative economy. And that's really how we think about it. And so we had a couple leading research questions. This is another thing that was very different about our studies. Most of the time, these studies are kind of put out there where it's like, we have the data, look, that's it. No probing, no questions, no interrogation, no sort of purpose to it, right? other than we found some numbers. Isn't that great? So ours was really this. Are the creative industries in Michigan thriving and innovative? How are Michigan's creative industries and occupations distributed and supported? How do creative industry stakeholders envision their future? And what external pressures will impact the future of the creative economy? And so again, just to run through the methodology very quickly, this was what's called a mixed method study. So it was both quantitative and qualitative. So we did a lot of work around human-centered kind of design thinking work as part of this, as well as just the quantitative part. And so with the quantitative part, we collected and analyzed a lot of different data sets. I'm happy to get into the weeds with anyone who wants to, but I'm gonna try and keep this pretty high level. But there are three major data sets that kind of all people in kind of economic development circles tend to use to report on the creative industries. So it was important for us to match them like for like and use these same data sets. So we did. And then finally, in terms of qualitative, we did a number of things. And that was an extensive literature review to find out what the state of the state was, as well as a horizon scan of emerging issues. So we really were looking at scenario planning for the future. We also were doing interviews with 31 thought leaders across the state. 
We did four participatory regional workshops in both Detroit, Grand Rapids, Ann Arbor, and Flint. And then finally, we held a Creative Economy Policy Summit midway through to assess and reframe and rethink how we were approaching the work. And we did that with regional and state leaders and had international and national speakers attend. And it happened during the Design Festival two years ago. So what are the creative industries? So a lot of the work that was done before this current study that I did was really around clustering and quantifying what our creative industries were. And there's a lot of stuff that goes behind these 12 clusters. I don't want to say how many uh, levels of you know, North American industry codes I had to go through or occupation codes I had to go through in order to get this. But effectively, there are 12. And they're the 12 you would think of, right? So you would think of advertising. You would think of architecture. You would think of art schools, artists, and agents, creative technology. There's some issues with how you actually quantify technology because as robust and resilient and important as technology is in our society, it has about three codes right now, right, to cover the entire thing at an, at an, at an entity level. And so while we want to absorb video games, we also have to absorb all those people that are doing just middleware, right, in terms of counting creative technology. We also think about culture and heritage. Those are our major museums and historical sites. We definitely think about design, and we're going to talk about design because it's one of the big news players that we have within our clusters. We also think about fashion, garment, and textile. It's an industry that's on the up, but the codes are really old, and so you don't actually find what you see in the news around new fashion and textile startup businesses actually being represented in the numbers. So there are some challenges that we find when we're actually articulating this. We talk about film, AV, and broadcasting, literary publishing and print, which is on a 10-year decline while it's still the largest segment of a lot of the creative industries in Michigan, music, performing arts, and visual arts. So these are our state-level findings. So in terms of wages alone, the creative industries give $4.97 in wages to Michigan's economy. So the next time somebody says the arts don't matter or the creative industries don't matter, we might be a small percentage, but we're a significant percentage of what Michigan does in terms of wages and revenue, right, compared to the overall $198 billion. That's 88,000 jobs. So when we want to say, hey, it's OK to cut the creative sector, or hey, by the way, our State Arts Council gets most of its funds through a block grant that comes from the NEA, but that's OK. We'll cut the NEA. That's cutting 88,000 jobs at risk in a state that needs every job that it can. And when we think about establishments, we also are having to think about how are we actually thinking about not just the startup, but the end up and the bin up. Right? So within our economy, we have a number of ways that we can incentivize young people to come in and be entrepreneurial. But how are we helping businesses that have been existing to scale? How do we help that architect win international contracts or national contracts, right? So that they're world leading and world beating rather than just Michigan based. And so that's how we think about this body of work. And so when we look at the percentages again, you're seeing 2.17, 2.51, 4.53 of all of the kind of state's work. And these are growing numbers, right? So when you actually dive into the really big report, I'm showing you kind of 2014 numbers, which was the last kind of uh, date that data was available before publication. But there's actually full trend information in the big study. So you can actually see what's been happening over time from about 2011 to 2014. And the idea is every two years we're going to do a release so you can continue to see trend information. And then finally, again, when we think about the largest segment of our creative industries, it's this design number. Within the country, we have the largest concentration of designers, and that largest concentration of designers is in Southeast Michigan. So when, again, we think about the story we have to tell about this place at this time, it is one about the power of design for transforming our economy. And again, we see this in wages, design comes up again. But funnily enough, in establishments, it's really visual arts and crafts. And that should be no surprise, because every individual artist who does that work to become an LLC 
all of a sudden becomes an enterprise level, right? So it's captured in this data. And if you're not thinking about becoming an LLC, that's fine. We still had other ways of quantifying you in this data set as well. So again, I mean, and you guys can dive into this. This is all online, so I'm not gonna belabor a lot of these points, but there's a really easy graphical way of looking at how the clusters stack up, right? So one of the things that we were really interested in is how you both see the numbers, but you see the numbers in context. And so within the actual report, there's a lot of storytelling about individual businesses and individual makers that are really telling the story behind the numbers all the way through. But as we can see, you can see some of the individual highlights, right? So again, while I point out that there's 15,000 people working in literary print and publishing, that's been on a 10-year decline. So what does it really mean to our state if we continue to lose those year on year on year on year when we used to be a publishing powerhouse? Again, when we think about wages and we think about a wage bill that looks like 987 million alone in design, right? That's a very important story. And it's a story that actually, in the report, breaks down into individual income levels. So you kind of know what could be an expected pay level for an entry-level designer. Use the BLS website when you're negotiating for your first job. It's like a really good way of anchoring yourself in the creative economy. And again, when we think about the establishment story, we think about this idea that we have, agent, we have industries that might be small in number, but are actually doing outsized performance in terms of work. So one of the interesting things about design, right, as we look at it, there's only about 18,000 establishments, right, for 17,000 employment. So what does that tell us in terms of the story? Is it one and two person shops being entrepreneurial and sexy online? No. These are people that are working in major legacy industries, right? Because the number of establishments are actually quite small, which means you have a large concentration of designers and a couple key legacy industries. If we don't diversify that in the future, we will begin to lose design. And so when we think about this, we also covered the regions. We had four key regions. We did Detroit, which is the three county area. We did Ann Arbor, we did Kent County, and then we also did uh, Flint. But I'm gonna cover just Detroit really quickly. Because the important thing here is, while the state findings were 4.9 billion in wages, Detroit is about 2.8 of that. So again, you have a heavy concentration of our creative industries within a 45 minute ra radius. What does that mean that we can do? What does that mean about the synergies that we can create in terms of opportunities, in terms of businesses, in terms of educational attainment for our design talent going forward? And when we look about at this breakdown of kind of non-creative workers in the creative industries, this is this number that government quite often likes, right? Because they all of a sudden go, well, I might be okay killing design jobs, but you mean I'm only gonna kill accounting jobs too? Right? So we like to tell them this number so that they actually think about the, this full supply chain impact of the way that our economy is actually good for the entire economy. So now I'm going to create a little heresy, and I promise that's mostly the numbers bit over, I swear. Just a little. The truth of the matter is this. More and better data does not simply equal more and better impact. It doesn't. It doesn't equal more and better investment. It certainly doesn't equal more and better policy. That takes us doing that work together. And the reality is these things are not equal, right? The way that we construct our society is we've given economics a kind of primacy that maybe they deserved, but maybe not. So I think we have to also be a little doubtful, right, about the role around economic impact and the role around measurement, right? We have to be a little skeptical in this space because while it's great to be able to tell you that design is an important driver of economic success in the Southeast Michigan region, it's more important for me that we get the quality of our cities right. 
It's more important to me that we see sustainable investment. It's more important to me that we actually think about adaptive change. And so the reality is this. I have a couple critical questions. Can individual practitioners and creative workers leverage and benefit from a reframing of the creative economy towards economic models that really prioritize this sense of economic justice? Right? That's what I'm interested in. Can we kind of restore the role of the creator and producer as the driver of economic benefit from our system as opposed to being subject to it? So allow me some truthiness, right? Since we're all playing with alternative facts in this day and age. We're running an adaptive change process and that's a heavy lift, right? For all of us, any of us as practitioners, I struggle with the idea that there are times I would love to garrison myself in the studio. I would really love to kind of close my eyes to what I see going on, right? Whether it's climate change, whether it's kind of economic impacts that perpetuate inequity, right? Whether it's kind of racial or social injustice through a variety of mechanisms. But I can't and I shouldn't. And so I want to lean in and I want to ask you all to lean into this idea that we're part of an adaptive change process, right? And fundamentally, this is all about value creation, and we should be in that fight. And so here's the problem with this. Anyone can exploit this. All you need is enough dissatisfaction, a clear and compelling vision, and so long as it's easy and quick and you can say it probably in a tweet. That's kind of where visioning is these days. And then you want people to take like a kind of very first easy step together, right? Because it should be simple and it should be reductive, right? And that's how you overcome resistance to change. That's how you shake things up, right? And so you have both in Podemos on the left in Spain, a number of governments, whether you're talking about Corbynistas in the UK, right? That are actually thinking about how do we just kind of shake things up because we're all dissatisfied and we're all going to create easy visions to actually move us to this change. And I would say we have to embrace kind of complexity. Yes, we have to do all these things too. Yes, we have to have a compelling vision. But I think we have to have a compelling, complex vision based on a complex vision of society. And so fundamentally, I think if you have a change process that also does not ask this question, then you are kind of actually leading people down the garden path a little bit. So finally, it's like, what must be kept and preserved and not taken for granted? How do we build for resiliency? And that doesn't mean efficiency and optimization. That means we have to create some redundancy in the system. We have to create some slip. It's not all up and to the right. Sometimes it's down and to the left, right? And so what I'll say is this. We have a website. Our director of public policy would kill me if I didn't actually tell you right now it is urgent that everybody think about how they can take action on the NEA, the NEHS, the PBS, and how we can support them through the federal budget process. So if you go to creativemini.org and you look on the Take Action link, you'll find out all the information there. You'll be able to write letters. You'll be able to get updates as we sort of are learning as we go through where we're going to shake out. So I will just say that that's really important and everybody should lean into this. And kind of finally, here's the thing, right? Economics matters and we should be in that fight. Our imaginative capacities, the way that we understand as designers what value is and can be for the future means that we should be in this despite how hard the language is, despite how opaque a government entity will try and make economic processes. But if we're not in this fight, then they will continue to measure what doesn't matter to us. And so we have to find better ways of having them both measure what matters to us, and we have to figure out how to quantify what we're doing in ways that they respect and sort of command the kind of authority they deserve. So I just want to say thank you so much. Um, you can find my ramblings online um, at ACE Wonk, that's Creative Economy Wonk, if you want to know what I think about science, technology, policy, and the creative economy. If you want to find more about Root of Two, you can find us at Root of Two. Um, but I just want to say thanks so much, and thanks to all to you.
what's a wonk? Uh, so I officially got to become, uh, so the question was, what's a wonk? Um, so I officially got to, to don the moniker of a policy wonk um, after I came out of school. And it's somebody who kind of gets in the weeds a little bit on really nerdy details. So I think we can all officially find ways to be wonkish, but um, it was something that kind of stuck because in a policy school that's known for its education and poverty work and its work on kind of economic development, I was the one creative person going, well, what about the creative economy, guys? So I am known as the creative economy policy wonk. Any other questions? Happy to take questions. I've been told I have to repeat them. Silence, crickets. I can, you know. Sure. Um, you focused on the peninsula in your words that by design, was that was that just what was the circumstance? Yeah. So. Essentially, the way that we um, collect the data, we actually collect the data for all of Michigan. Um, so we have both Lower Peninsula and Upper Peninsula, and in my kind of Excel data set where I can sort of look at what's happening in Lapeer as well as in other places, we can actually deliver reports for all of those individual places. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing is trying to work with different local regions and the governor's like nine prosperity regions in particular to kind of give them their individual reports. But for us, we really, in our reports, wanted to focus on key areas where we have both um, on the ground presence, programmatic work, had already been working with governments that were looking at kind of implementing the creative industries um, and their kind of creative uh, economy policies into their economic development plans. And so really that looked like our four key regions. Um, I have to say that technically Flint would have not been in that list, except they had gone really far forward in terms of including the creative industries in their economic development plans. Um, actually Kalamazoo I think ranks as like the third or fourth region um, if we were only doing it numerically in terms of the creative industries. So it was a kind of combination of both on the ground leadership that was really ready um, to have a conversation about the creative industries as well as otherwise. But then there's the full state reports and we can generate kind of smaller reports for other counties. Sure. Yeah, so that's um, uh, one of the things that's really, oh yes. So the question was, what is the impact of the seasonal festivals that we have in Michigan? And so I will say that that's one of the areas um, that we've been trying to think about how we do these studies. Before kind of this larger study, we did a number of kind of studies that were really kind of focused on individual artists and kind of creative practitioners around just specifically festivals up in um, the northeast uh, of the state, particularly around like the Traverse City Film Festival and the Terry Festival. And the thing that we found is that you have both seasonal travelers, you have seasonal artists, um, and so if you're only looking at quantitative, you're getting kind of really high level, averaged out kind of lens, and you can't do that work. And so we started working more towards qualitative work. So we did some survey methodologies up north around kind of vacation and tourism. We did that with their local economic development councils um, and tourism councils. We now have a seat on the Tourism Council for Michigan. We also look specifically in one of our other reports at the impact of tourism. So I think the creative sector makes up something like 2.4, 2.8 billion of our tourism, which is more than golf and boating and lots of other things in Michigan. Um, so again, that's a nice story to tell. So we're really trying to figure out like, you know, how we're in all of those conversations. Um, but there are some particularities that I, I think uh, it's hard to sort of just drill down into festivals. Each of the big festivals, though, do their own economic impact studies. So like Ann Arbor does a really big economic impact study. Art Prize does a really big one as well around their work. Um, so a number of the festivals are getting really savvy about doing that for themselves too. Other questions? So you, you, uh, first of all, thank you for Thanks. a great presentation and compelling data. And I was particularly intrigued when you began to project that data for based on 10 years, and okay, this is what's happened in the last 10 years, and yeah. you reasonably project this work. I wonder how you accomplish that when you're dealing with more qualitative measures. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so the question was, how do you do kind of uh, forecasting, essentially, um, in the qualitative frame? So you know, if you can do sort of trend projections both back and forward through quantitative measures, how do you do that in terms of qualitative? This was one of the things that was really brought to us by our research partner, um, Kerr Smith. Uh, they're known for their foresight work. Um, Helen Care is actually based out of OCAD, U in Canada, um, and heads up their strategic foresight work. And so essentially we worked through a couple different processes, and the first one was their scenario planning and their three horizons. So kind of in these stakeholder workshops around the state, we essentially had people kind of in a qualitative uh, workshop kind of project out kind of their middle term, far term, and sort of close term kind of needs, wants, ideas, right? So that was kind of one way that we looked at forecasting in the kind of qualitative space. The other way that we did it was also through scenario planning, which is another technique that they engage quite a lot. So that is much more through kind of documented media analysis and kind of online kind of scanning of their horizon, right? And so uh, interestingly enough, the National Intelligence Committee does this too, and it actually hires science fiction writers to do this. Um, so that's another industry you can go into. But essentially the way that this works is it looks at future scenarios based on things that are steeped in the presence. And there's some like really kind of nice websites that like look at this, like Gapminder is one. You can look at Gartner Hype Cycles, which is another. So there are things like that that are kind of forecasting issues around automation and digitization. There's also uh, you know, economists that are heavily looking at this because one of the things that's really kind of both frightening and otherwise is that depending on the economic forecast you look at, we're gonna be displacing something like 35% of workers out of the American workforce over the next 10 years. Um, and those are jobs that in general, we're not thinking of replacements for, right? And that's just through automation and digitization. And so there's a kind of fundamental question about like how far you go into the weeds in terms of really forecasting out negative scenarios. Um, so I, I think we tried to balance both the kind of dystopic and utopic. Um, so we looked at kind of uh, the way that, you know, Deloitte will talk about, you know, how we make meaningful workplaces for millennials. There's a lot of literature already on that. And that's going to be a trend that's going to continue to impact employers out. And so we kind of looked at those things and then kind of really brought it back to the creative frame. So a couple of different tools, but it tended to be document and media analysis and kind of video analysis work. Margins of error? Any of <laughs> Margins of error. So essentially the way that this study was conducted um, was we did the, we used three different data sets. So one is the non-employer statistics. The other one is the quarterly census of employment and wages. And then finally, we actually used um, the uh, occupational employers database, right? And so all of the margins of error are actually calculated within those data sets before they're released to researchers. So I would have to go back and look those up, but all of those then have full published methodologies on the BLS and census website. So for us, we're really just reporting existing government analytics. So there wasn't really a margin of error for our research, um, but you can find all of that documentation both in uh, the technical part, <laughs> the technical index of our report, as well as on the BLS website and census website. Uh, and the question was margin of error. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, I would. Um, so a couple things. So yes, we did. Uh, we did look at, um, and it's a it's a tricky thing. So one of the the kind of um, things about actually doing kind of comparative analysis is almost always if you're comparing to somebody else's research study you're having to then sort of um, crosswalk their data from your data or their clustering to your clustering. So what we did instead was say, this is our clusters. And then we brought in data for all 50 states and all counties. And if I were to open that Excel workbook, it would take a while because my computer runs a little slow. Um, so we can see it. And we did publish some of that based on location quotient in the large study. Um, so we kind of looked at other Great Lakes states around us. We also looked at other states that had 
um, kind of similar policy uh, emphasis and also similar size state arts council budgets in some cases. And so there's an ordered list in the back of the research study that kind of looks at that. Um, but the thing that we consistently hear, and, and I say it is a good time um, to be an architect and designer in Southeast Michigan and in Michigan, but there are some caveats to that. And I, and I think it's this area where you can't be a kind of, um, no offense, but we talk about the designer as entrepreneur, right? So we, of course, want people and need people who are gonna go and work in our legacy industries. But we also need people who are willing to sort of be more entrepreneurial and think about the companies we don't have yet and that we're gonna need in the future. And we need to have people who are thinking about the intersection between design and technology. We need people who are gonna be thinking about the revolution around kind of micro manufacture, right? And how we're thinking about kind of the way that we're going to consume goods in the future. Um, we also need designers who are going to think critically about what not to design, right? Like sometimes the best product is the one you don't make, right? Because we can't kind of keep producing in the way that we did before. So yes, but it's not going to be the design of the past where you just walk into a job and you're set for life. Um, so I would just say that while those industries are still enjoying compared to like other industries and other places that have already shed those jobs, we haven't yet shed those jobs. But we will be shedding some of those jobs. And so we really need people who are going to both, you know, fill those in different ways, but then those that are actually thinking about kind of the new companies for the future. Um, but I do think it's a good time because there's a set of resources, there's a set of kind of optics that make it really good to be a designer right now, particularly in Southeast Michigan. And I think Again, this is one of the few places you can wear as many hats as you want to. Um, and I think that's important. So, other questions? Uh, yeah, apologies if I haven't said it, uh, but where is Creative Mini operating? I know you said it in Detroit, <laughs> yeah. where exactly in Detroit? And do you think that has an impact on your research or your, your advocacy in general? For sure. So, um, we are actually headquartered in Tech Town. Um, our office is on the third uh, people are welcome to stop by. Sometimes we're there. Um, as you can imagine, we're a small staff, so we also have offices in Lansing as well as Grand Rapids. In Grand Rapids, we're in the Stark Garden uh, incubator and accelerator space, so it's really important for us to sort of be in these kind of incubator spaces. In Lansing, we're in the runway, which is a kind of fashion incubator space and garment industry incubator space. Um, and so, I will say this, when we were in Wexham, we did a lot of very similar work. Um, the programs that I run kind of started in 2008. So since 2008, we've been doing a lot of work and heavy lifting around support for individual artists and creative practitioners across all disciplines, whether that be through the professional development program or through our lawyers program that makes it really easy and accessible for you to sort of get an attorney to help sort of have IP in your business or do an entity formation. So we've had all of these programs. Um, and so I would say most of my time when I was in Wixom was I would spend two days kind of out in Wixom and then most of my days were squatting in a coffee shop somewhere in Detroit, which is probably why I'm curating a coffee shop in France, right? Because, the, because really you have to be in the studio, right? You have to be where the makers are making. You have to sort of really understand how you go from policy to practice and back again. And so our peer organizations in other states don't look like us. There's nobody in our peer organization in Minnesota, even though they have tons of funding for the arts, that's also going to be curating, that's also going to be doing professional development. That's a kind of particularity to Michigan, and it's born out of the circumstances of us continually cutting right, our infrastructure. And so we have a lot of Franken orgs, to be quite honest. And so we were a Franken org until we sort of pulled all of our parts together and became more cohesive. And I would say the move to Detroit really helped solidify that. Other questions? Yes? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, you're not training as a designer. Like I'm you, not. You a designer. I did. What would you recommend if it were to take a course in school, elective, or other types of things? What would you recommend? Cool.
coding? <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I think really this interplay of kind of um, we're, we're not going to be done with kind of the Internet of Things and we're not going to be done for a long time with the intersection between kind of big data and products and wearables and kind of, e and I would say, you know, even as we think about um, and one of the kind of areas that I'm really interested in now is in this question of, uh, you know, the smart city, right? And how we kind of are going to sleepwalk into the very worked and very connected city and we're not going to have a really big public conversation about privacy and we're not going to have a really big conversation about, you know, how we're going to actually deal with drones in the national airspace or for that matter, floating warehouses that Amazon's designing, right? So because we're not going to have those kind of big civil society conversations, it's still going to probably be done by technical experts. The only way you can really impact that is to become a kind of technical expert yourself. So to find ways to kind of get into those conversations and into those fights. Um, so that if you're bringing a kind of equity lens to the work, if you're bringing a kind of uh, resilience lens to that work, if you're really thinking about um, climate change and climate adaptation and mitigation, if you're really thinking about structurally how we're rebuilding our cities, especially our deindustrialized cities um, for the future, then I, I think you have to find ways to make you be um, a universal connector, right? So you have to have your own discipline base, but then you also have to be able to pour it into the, uh, these other conversations. But I think, you know, anything that you can pick up in terms of coding, anything you can think about in terms of critical thinking, um, I spend a lot of time around like speculative work. So like design thinking in the policy realm is called anticipatory governance, who knew? Right? So I spent all my time going, it's the same thing, and they kept telling me, no, it's different because it's government. But it is this ability fundamentally to sort of think and have imaginative capacity for future making. And I, and I sort of would say that the mission in Remit for Designers Now is how we really sort of reimagine the future. And so I think you can come at that as a traditionally disciplined designer, you can come at that as a diff use designer, I certainly came um, kind of out of a theater background that was both performative and then heavy on the tech and heavy on the design for that. But I sort of feel like you have to be extra disciplinary in this day and age. So thanks so much. <laughs>